Hi, this is uh, David Villar, and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation that will address uh, therapies for one of the most common reasons why dogs and cats are taken to the veterinarian. Just like it happens to any of us, uh, dogs and cats are going to develop diarrhea episodes in their lives at some point in time. Uh, we're going to see it uh, sooner or later, and it's just a matter of time when and where it will happen. And there are just as many uh, possible therapies as uh, reasons why pets develop diarrhea. And this is evident when we look at the huge number of diets that are now available to treat gastrointestinal uh, problems. And the same can be said for uh, probiotic medications uh, that are indicated to replace the normal gut microflora. So as you can imagine, uh, finding the actual source of the animal's problem and getting to the bottom of what's uh, truly going on is going to be the best guide to decide what uh, we need to do on each uh, situation. So if in the previous video we talk about the different approaches to make a diagnosis, uh, here we're going to focus on the treatment for the most common causes of, of the diarrhea. And because of the source of the diarrhea could always be an infectious organism that could be potentially uh, transmissible to people, any dog or cat with diarrhea should always be suspect of having a zoonotic disease until proven otherwise. Uh, we have probably all heard of uh, salmonellosis, and that's just one type of uh, bacterial infection that is uh, transmitted from animals to humans. And what we don't usually uh, think of is that we can also pass on our infections uh, to our pets. So uh, pers uh, good personal hygiene habits uh, go a long way to prevent that transmission from ever uh, taking place. Diarrhea is uh, one of those uh, conditions that uh, has always been treated empirically uh, without real evidence of what we're truly uh, treating for. And there is probably, uh, is probably one of those conditions for which uh, there are more uh, treatment protocols uh, that lack medical support than any other. And uh, for example, uh, based on absolutely nothing, the bowel needs to rest to restore its normal function. So the practice of uh, withholding food for even 24 hours may, not, may actually be worse uh, because uh, the rapid turnover of that mucosal epithelium uh, usually needs a very constant uh, supply of nutrients that come from food. And this has been uh, proven particularly so in uh, uh, scouring uh, baby calves and it's no longer recommended to withhold milk that provides all the essential nutrients and calories that a sick calf uh, requires uh, to get back to normal. So unless the animal has severe vomiting, it may not be wise to upset the animal even further uh, by fasting. And now another uh, misconception is uh, considering a highly digestible diet as a bland diet. Uh, chicken and rice only are deficient on many things. Highly digestible diet it's usually one that uh, we tend to reach for cases of acute enteritis and they don't usually require the action of bile and pancreatic secretions. Uh, for example, they replace uh, uh, long fatty acids uh, by medium change fatty acids. They also have antioxidants and omega fatty acids and they usually tend to provide all the essential nutrients. So if you plan on using a bland diet, just uh, remember that it should probably be done for no more than a few days. As uh, we will discuss later, uh, most uh, veterinarians uh, prescribe antibiotics for dogs with acute diarrhea. And this is uh, really alarming because uh, they should not really be considered as a first line of therapy. And probably uh, nutritional management, deworming, uh, probiotics, and maybe some antidiarrheal agents is probably all that we need uh, for acute cases. Now another uh, old wife's uh, tale is uh, considering chicken as a hypoallergic diet. It may not have as many allergens as uh, beef or dairy products, but it still may cause uh, food sensi sensitivity. And finally, uh, there is recent evidence showing that uh, probiotics have pretty convincing effects uh, restoring the gut microflora and helping that animal uh, get off the toilet, so to speak. Uh, however, uh, as we will see, there are many over-the-counter products that have very little oversight, uh, no real uh, quality control studies, so unless uh, the claims are supported with research, you probably want to stay away from some of those uh, generic uh, names. So again, the principles of uh, therapy should follow a complete workup. Uh, so we design the treatment to match the right condition that causes the diarrhea. And uh, as we will see, this can be quite challenging, uh, particularly in cases of uh, chronic diarrhea. So even though there, the things that may cause acute and chronic diarrhea 
uh, may sometimes overlap. Uh, the therapeutic uh, plan uh, initially is usually uh, for each one is going to be different. And in many occasions, we're going to reach a diagnosis by exclusion and response to different uh, therapeutic uh, trials. So we're going to begin with this uh, beagle, uh, which has had diarrhea for at least uh, three or more weeks. And if we take a look at this uh, diagram, the majority of chronic cases will have an origin within the intestines, and they could be either inflammatory, infectious, or neoplasious in that order. We're going to discuss uh, the most common ones, which are the inflammatory and infectious uh, situations, uh, in more detail on the next few slides. But just keep in mind that there are other uh, differentials, like lymphoma, uh, which is probably the most uh, common type of neoplasia, and uh, fortunately it responds better than other types of uh, uh, neoplasias uh, to chemotherapy uh, protocols. And uh, there are also diseases that are outside of the GI uh, that will also cause uh, chronic diarrhea. Uh, the most common one in this category is uh, pancreatic insufficiency, uh, which usually responds well to oral treatment with uh, enzymes. And in this uh, secondary group, uh, you obviously need to treat the underlying disease first if you expect that diarrhea to go away. And we could also include things like diabetes, hyperthyroidism, adrenal insufficiency. But as I say, probably the most common one is going to be uh, pancreatic uh, insufficiency. So if we focus on the most common causes of chronic disease, the number one falls into different types of inflammatory conditions. And within this group, the most frequent one is uh, food responsive enteropathy in about 60% of those cases. Uh, the way to diagnose this type is by doing an exclusion or elimination diet in which uh, we basically replace the original diet by either a novel or a hydrolyzed diet. Uh, with novel, we mean something that has not been fed previously and hopefully uh, will not have the offending component of that original diet. And if it is a diet responsive condition, most animals will get better in about one to two weeks, uh, which as you can see, it's uh, much uh, shorter than uh, for allergic uh, skin disorders uh, that may take up to uh, six to eight weeks to respond. When we talk about the hydrolyzed diet, uh, those are the ones that uh, the proteins have been broken down into small peptides of about six to 15 uh, kilodalton which is below the radar screen uh, that will be picked up by uh, the immune system as uh, foreign antigens. Now, the other uh, less common types of inflammatory uh, enteropathies are the antibiotic responsive and the immunosuppressant uh, responsive. Uh, the first one is unclear because it, there is no single bacteria that has been identified. And the speculation is that the syndrome is caused by an overgrowth of many different uh, type of bacteria. And uh, the animals uh, usually tend to respond well to metronidazole or tylosine uh, for a course of one, of, a, of one to two weeks. And finally, if a therapeutic uh, trial with uh, food and antibiotics uh, do not resolve the situation, the next step is usually a protocol with uh, prednisone for several weeks. And sometimes to avoid the side effects of corticosteroids, uh, you can try uh, cyclosporine, which has been shown to work pretty well for those cases that are uh, immune, uh, uh, immunosuppressant uh, responsive. So as you can see, uh, in all these cases uh, of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, the cause of the enteropathy uh, will be an exclusion diagnosis in which you basically systematically go one step at a time, ruling out the different possibilities uh, that may underline the problem. And uh, just remember that uh, there are also a genetic uh, predisposition uh, in certain uh, breeds like the German Shepherds. And uh, there is research uh, showing that there are certain mutations of proteins in the immune system like the toll-like re toll -like receptors that make these uh, uh, particular uh, breeds uh, more susceptible. So if you were to have a dog that comes into the clinic with chronic diarrhea, it may be worth looking if, uh, if there is a genetic uh, predisposition uh, on that particular uh, breed. So this is kind of the roadmap that can be followed to diagnose cases of uh, chronic diarrhea. 
And for some uh, causes, uh, there may be a specific test that can be used, uh, particularly for the secondary causes of diarrhea. But uh, if I were to ask you, uh, what important category are we missing here in this diagram? Uh, what would you say? Well, you notice uh, the parasitic ones tend to fall within the infectious uh, categories. And within this group, we have the whipworms, uh, the roundworms, and the unicellular uh, bugs. And because uh, fecal testing is relatively simple to do, it should always be part of a diagnostic workup uh, to rule out these uh, uh, parasitic infections. And the classical uh, drug to deal with the big ones is usually fenbendazole for about five days. For Giardia, you can go with uh, metronidazole, uh, which is usually the first line of therapy. But you can try uh, fenbendazole that also targets this organism. So if you were to have, for example, a co-infection with roundworms and Giardia, that would probably be the drug of, of choice. Uh, for Cristosporidium, uh, the drug of choice appears to be acetromycin. For trichomonas, uh, you can go with either metronidazole or uh, it's been shown that sometimes they only respond to uh, ronidazole. And for, co for coccidia, we have either uh, metronidazole or uh, ponasuril, which is the active ingredient of Baycox. So as I, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, there are a lot of different commercial diets that should be part of uh, protocols uh, for GI conditions. And this is really a topic that there is an overwhelming amount of research and development. So here I'm just going to say a little bit about the different types of diets that are uh, now available. And uh, we're gonna break it down in for cases of chronic uh, diarrhea, and then we'll see the ones for acute uh, diarrhea. Now, until we have a definitive diagnosis, uh, you can try changing the diet in cases of a small bowel diarrhea and hoping that it, it may be a food responsive enteropathy. We have already mentioned the hydrolyzed and the novel diets. Now, when the diarrhea originates uh, from the large bowel, uh, we can try with a diet containing high fibers, ideally a mixture of soluble and insoluble fibers. Uh, fibers are basically made up of uh, complex uh, carbohydrates uh, which cannot be broken down by uh, mammalian enzymes. Uh, for example, they contain uh, cellulose, which, as you know, makes up the plant cell walls. And in that respect, they are obviously not essential uh, uh, for dogs and cats. And because they can bind nutrients and reduce their absorption, the downside is that the animal may not get enough calories and will need to eat more. Now, the reason why they can be beneficial in cases of uh, colitis is because some of those uh, sugars will ferment in the colon and produce a small change fatty acids uh, like uh, butyric acid, uh, which is a good nutrient for colonocytes. And by also uh, lowering the pH of the colon, they also increase the amount of the good bacteria and tend to decrease the ones that may cause diarrhea like uh, clostridium. And the other effect of fiber is uh, that it tends to normalize the transit time uh, by changing the motility. So in cases of diarrhea, they may prolong transit time. And uh, if you were to have a constipation, it may do the opposite. Uh, that is uh, shortening uh, the transit time. It'll probably do, do so by uh, increasing the fecal bulk, uh, which tends to stimulate defecation. So when we refer to uh, prebiotics, uh, fibers uh, would be one type because it favors the proliferation of the good bacteria in the colon. And uh, if we say a few things about probiotics, uh, there is uh, new evidence suggesting that it should probably be part of most uh, protocols uh, to manage uh, GI problems. Uh, there is uh, very convincing uh, effects that they tend to uh, lessen the duration of diarrhea in many uh, situations, uh, whether this is an acute or a chronic or a large or a small bowel diarrhea. Uh, probiotics are basically a culture of uh, live uh, good bugs uh, that are supposed to outcompete or suppress the bad guys in the intestines. And they also seem to enhance or stimulate the local immune system. I will not really say much uh, more about uh, probiotics here, except that there are many different ones on the market with no uh, quality control studies uh, to support that they actually have any clinical benefit. So you may want to check uh, what has been done to prove that they actually work and they meet the label claims. And uh, on this uh, study uh, in the Canadian Veterinary Journal, 
they found that uh, only four out of 15 products on, on the market that had a, a specific claims of viable organisms, uh, only uh, four of those 15 met or exceeded the label claims. So uh, this is something that you just may want to uh, keep in mind if you're going to uh, decide to choose uh, probiotics. So let's say a few things about uh, treatment for acute cases of diarrhea. Most of the times, uh, acute cases are going to be self-limiting, uh, and whenever the thing that causes it uh, runs it, its uh, course, uh, they tend to resolve. So in this case, the situation of the, of the, the idea of the treatment in most uh, times is going to help that diarrhea go away faster. The first uh, two uh, motility uh, modifiers are uh, loperamide and diphenoxylate. These two uh, tend to increase those uh, segmental uh, contractions and that uh, by constricting the size of the lumen, basically they slow the movement of feces along the GI. And uh, what happens in many cases of diarrhea is that the bowel loses its uh, smooth muscle tone, but the decrease on those uh, segmental contractions is greater than the peristal peristaltic uh, contractions. And that explains uh, the increased movement of feces and defecations uh, that we're going to see in diarrhea. Now, the anti-secretory effect of these two uh, narcotic drugs uh, may actually be more important in slowing the movement of feces uh, through the gut. Uh, with regards to the anticholinergics, uh, this may have a role uh, when we have spastic contractions. As, for example, when you see an animal with uh, tenesmus or a crampal uh, rectal pain. Uh, if we talk about the anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, they, they work by uh, preventing the formation of uh, prostaglandins, which is uh, actually a way of counteracting the action of many bacterial uh, toxins. Uh, without those prostaglandins, there is going to be less secretion of fluid in the intestines. And apart from the anti-inflammatory actions, uh, with uh, some of them like pectobismol, there appears to be a protective effect uh, by coating or uh, shielding the mucosa from those uh, bacterial toxins. And uh, you've probably all taken kaopectate uh, at some point in time. Uh, the funny thing is that there are no really good uh, control studies uh, proving that it, it actually uh, works. Uh, theoretically, it's a type of clay that binds toxins. And this way, uh, they may, it may decrease the secretion of fluid into the GI. Now, what's uh, definitely a good magnet or absorbent for those uh, bacterial enterotoxins is uh, activated charcoal which is also known as uh, the universal antidote because it, it will bind many other uh, potential uh, poisons and prevent them from absorbing and getting into the bloodstream. Uh, the downside with activated charcoal is that it tends to be messy to administer and, then, and that may deter some people from uh, using it. Well, before I finish, uh, I wanted to point out this study that was done among uh, British uh, veterinarians in their habits uh, for dogs with acute diarrhea. Uh, the results show that 71% of uh, 371 dogs got antibiotics uh, for, uh, to treat uh, acute diarrhea. And if we read the conclusion of the study at the bottom, the frequent use of antibacterial for acute diarrhea is surprising and somewhat alarming. There is evidence that resistance to antimicrobials is increasing among bacteria isolated from pets, uh, nutritional management, therapeutic deworming, and probiotic therapy, accompanied in some cases by anti-diarrheal agents, should be the f considered the first line of therapy. So just to remember that for acute cases, antibiotics should not be the first thing that comes to mind, and you may want to try this other alternative first. Uh, it was not uh, mentioned here, and I didn't really say anything about it, but uh, if the acute cases were to be caused by parvovirus, uh, that would be a game changer. Uh, in, in this, and in those cases, you definitely want to use antibiotics uh, because the animal usually dies from a septicemic uh, shock. So this uh, was my final slide. I hope it was uh, worth your time. Uh, there were many things covered and I know most of them require more in-depth analysis. But the idea was to give you a quick overview uh, that may help you design your own therapeutic plan for diarrhea. So until next time, bye-bye uh, for now.